Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Shaw here, and today we are going to be talking about the 1970s. Uh, again, we're going to be taking this a little bit, uh, it's going to be kind of fast, but not super fast in, in the sense that uh, we're, ju we're just going to really kind of focus on the presidents and, and wh what the major events were for each of the presidents during their, uh, their presidency. Uh, so again, during the 70s and 80s, we see this really uh, different movement uh, come up, which again, Again, we've been talking about the civil rights movement and the social movements. Uh, you think of like counterculture and all those, uh, all, all those different, you know, different aspects. Pe people fighting for equality, and then we have the hippie movement as well. That's like more about liberalism and. Uh, you know, di uh, you know, drug use and like sexual freedom and things like that. So now <clears throat> we're kind of seeing the end of that. And, and again, you'll see kind of a, a rising conservative movement of people who are really worried about the um, like the, 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 the more liberal notions of, you know, the hippies and, uh, you know, and some of the other groups that are that are fighting for equality. So uh, that's why we call it this rise of conservatism uh, in, in the 70s and 80s. So let's go ahead and get to it. And let's start with Nixon. All right, so Richard Nixon was president from 1969 to 1974. He is one of the most controversial presidents, mostly because uh, he was the only he's the only president to have resigned uh, his office. Um, so that's really key, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But let's get to his foreign policy first. Okay, so first thing is Nixon. Uh, we, we've already kind of talked about this. We talked about the Vietnamization of the Vietnam War, which means that it would, they were pushing the uh, the responsibility of Vietnam and fighting Vietnam War from the United States onto the South Vietnam. Uh, so during Nixon's uh, presidency, though, the the, uh, the Paris Peace Accords are signed and the U.S. troops officially leave Vietnam. Uh, and then North Vietnam continues that war after the Paris Peace Accords are signed. And then now they unite Vietnam under uh, under communism and it still remains so to this day. Uh, one thing that's going to be really important for, uh, for for the 70s is OPEC, which is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Uh, again, places like Saudi Arabia, uh, Venezuela, things like that. Um, again, and they are going to, and it's just a group of these countries. Again, you can kind of see them over here. Um, and they are going to place an embargo on oil, which is going to lead to a gas shortage. Um, so again, this is really important just because they, like, we realized during the 70s, like, how dependent we are on foreign oil. Uh, and really just, the, like, how, how dependent every, like, the entire world is on, on oil. So that's really relevant. To, um, and so, like, this gas shortage, like, you see this sign here. It says gas shortage sales limited to 10 gallons of gas per customer. Uh, again, like we have not really seen that in our time. Um, but again, the price is going to skyrocket for, for, for gas, uh, and, and oil and barrels of oil, things like that. Uh, and it's going to lead, lead us to kind of look for some other things that, you know, what are some other ways that we can kind of do this or, or, you know, make sure we're providing enough oil for, um, you know, for all Americans. Uh, but again, we don't necessarily want to keep relying on, on the, the, the foreign oil because they have a lot of power over us. Uh, speed limits during that time were set to 55 miles an hour to save gas. And the economy, the economy definitely started to suffer. Again, you think if people are uh, like they're having to pay more money for gas, they're not going to have as much money for, you know, consumer products and things like that. Uh, but also, like, even if you're just struggling to get to work, like you might lose your job because you can't, uh, you know, you can't put gas in your car and there's not really another way to to get to work. So, again, we that, that, that's a very, uh, very important thing that, that Americans in the 70s were dealing with. OK. Um, oops. Sorry about that. Uh, so Nixon's foreign policy continuing. He actually established re relations with China, which is really relevant. He w uh, was actually the first president to go over to China uh, since uh, Mao Zedong's re revolution in the late 1940s. Uh, so the other thing that he uh, he d instituted in the Cold War, remember that the Cold War is still happening. Like we haven't talked about it in a little while, um, but it is like, you know, throughout all of the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, the Cold War is, is still going on, uh, and it won't really end until actually, I think, 1990 or 1991. So he started a policy known as detente, which was easing tensions uh, with the USSR. 
Uh, and then the other thing that he started was called the SALT uh, salt talks, or they're not really talking, this is the strategic arms limitation talks uh, to reduce nuclear weapons. Uh, so again, r really positive things that were that are coming out of Nixon's foreign policy. Really, Nixon, especially when it comes to foreign policy, he, he really did a pretty good job, uh, but his domestic policy really kind of hurt him. So again, a couple good things for him. Let's get into his domestic policy. Okay, so um, a couple things that you need to know. Um, he is was really the first president to really emphasize law and order. Uh, the crime in in America had had steadily increased, but it, it was really because of poverty. Like poverty, especially in the cities, you think about like suburbias, or, you know, suburbias, that's not a word, uh, like the, the rise of suburbia in the 50s. Again, if everybody's moving to the suburbs, uh, and you know, middle, all, like mostly middle class families are, are, and, and upper class families are moving to the suburbs, that means that people in the cities are going to now be like le left there by themselves and they only have, you know, so much money. They don't have as many opportunities. People are also moving their businesses out to the suburbs as well. Uh, so that's really important just because we don't really, uh, we didn't really think about how that was going to affect people. So now again, when you are in poverty, you are, are more likely to, uh, you know, you have a higher likelihood of, of, be, of, you know, committing crimes because there are less options, you know, less legal options for you to do. Um, so anyway, that was there was a, ri a, a really huge rise in crime, but it was also uh, relevant because Nixon launched what's called the War on Drugs. And he criminalized, um, you know, the possession, selling, anything like that of, uh, you know, of, of drugs. Uh, again, uh, in, you know, anything from, you know, marijuana all the way to, you know, heroin. And so, again, you see the, the war on drugs was launched here in 1971 uh, or 1970 or 71. And then again, the prison population exploded because it was a crime to, uh, you know, a lot, most of these were just non nonviolent drug offenders. Uh, and they, and, and again, like, obviously we don't want drugs on the streets. Like that's, you know, that, that's, that needs to be said. Uh, however, uh, it's also important to remember that, you know, the, 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 the part of the reason why people were doing what they were doing. Um, again, so the, he, I, I skipped the Southern strategy here, uh, but I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. He establishes the DEA, which is the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, so the, the, this is, and again, you see like propaganda like this uh, all the time. Public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. Uh, and that was, you know, Nixon, Nixon was a, a firm believer in that. And as Ronald Reagan will be uh, in the 80s as well. So, this is it's it's important just because it's kind of a shift now. And the biggest thing that that you need to understand about this this law and order and the war on drugs policy is that it targeted African Americans and and minorities more than any other group. And so that's and again I, the reason I tell you that is just because it is you know that that is a a a again Nick Nixon knew what he was doing and like the there is a he had there is a. A, um, there's a, one of one of his aides actually says that they knew what they were doing, that they were targeting, you know, minorities, and so uh, it's, this is probably really one of the biggest things that is, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a stain on Nixon's presidency. Um, unfortunately, though, there's still a lot, of, a lot of misunderstanding about what is going on, you know, in these cities and, and why things are the way that they are. Uh, and so that needs to be that needs to be spoken on as well. Uh, the other thing that Nixon does is, is he mentions the Southern strategy. Again, this was an attempt to change the Republican Party to be able to attract more people. Uh, specifically, Republican policies om almost always focus on uh, on on businesses and like laissez-faire uh, po like economic policies for the government, and so that's good and it helps a lot of businesses. However, that you know only if you only are appealing to business owners, you're never going to win elections. So the Southern strategy was how do we uh, capitalize on uh, on the, on the South? Again, we're going to focus on evangelicals so that means people who are religious usually protestant christians and then all again and the way that we're going to get them is by uh, having a a pro-life uh policy yeah on our on our or for for our party and so they adopted the pro-life policy, which is going to be very important to attracting evangelicals. Again, teen pregnancy was rising during this time as well. Um, and so that was, that was kind of one way to, to attract them. Uh, he also talked about gun rights. Again, the Second Amendment and really uh, trying to, um, you know, make, making that a part of the Republican platform as well. And then uh, the last thing, I, it's escaping me. It's gone. 
Uh, oh, so the the civil the civil rights movement in general um, was was you know going and and people were gaining a lot more rights, and so they they were kind of trying to capitalize on the fear of of white Southerners who were you know they were seeing the the rights everyone else getting rights, uh, and and again there was this perception that they were losing some, and so they like the Republicans were really able to kind of capitalize on that. Uh, and the, and that's why you see things like the war on drugs, the, like the law and order. You know that is, um, you know, th- those are going. That's going to be rhetoric that that those, you know, those those th- those white people in the South really wanted to hear. So anyway, that's Nixon. Real quick, let's get to Watergate. Um, so the biggest thing I need to re- I really need you to know is the effects, um, but I'm just going to kind of break it down for you real quick. So what happened was, so Watergate is actually a hotel, and this is the hotel, um, and it, five men were caught breaking into the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate Hotel. Again, this was during the election time, or the election was coming up, I believe it was 1972, I want to say. And so the Watergate scandal is the administration's attempt to cover up the break-in. Uh, so they basically destroyed documents. They tried to stop the investigation. They tried to buy burglars, the burglar's silence, uh, all kinds of things to to attempt to cover up uh, President Nixon's involvement in the scandal. And so basically, I think what, what, what actually happened is that um, Nixon, th- these people— Either we don't. We, the thing we don't really know is if Nixon directly told these people, you know, these five, or the 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 twenty five members or the five people that broke into the hotel to actually do that, um, and we're really still not sure about that. But uh, what we know is that after Nixon found out about it, he tried to cover it up, and that was what um, was the you know the impeachable offense, the high crimes and misdemeanors uh, that was going to get him impeached. Uh, so anyway, the, it, it came out that Nixon recorded all of his conversations in the White House, and uh, then the, the the prosecutors wanted to, and, and the Senate wanted to hear those tapes. And they wanted to see those tapes, so he released redacted documents um, of the conversations. But uh, that wasn't good enough, and the court ruled, uh, the Supreme Court ruled actually that he had to release the full tapes. And once he did, it basically shows that he he know he knew knew of the cover up. Um, and or the the administration role in the cover up, um, and it was very. I mean, again, and he was like cursing all the time, and like you know, it, it, he was ju- you know just kind of showing that he wasn't a very nice person. And uh, anyway, so they they were going to impeach him, uh, but before the full House votes on impeachment, Nixon decides to resign instead. Uh, so he is the first president to ever resign, um, and th- it's very relevant just because it's. You, you know, it, it had never happened before. But the biggest thing to take about, about this or to take away about this is that the public and the media are going to develop cynicism about public officials. Remember that the Vietnam had kind of already started that. We were not really very trusting of our government anymore. But now Watergate's really going to take that. And, you know, just the, the, the distrust, or the lack of trust in the government uh, is going to be very, very high now. Anyway, so now we have Gerald Ford as president. Um, so Gerald Ford, sorry, he served from 1974 to 1977. He is the only president to never be elected, and I'll go get into that in just a second. Um, so Ford became – so the first thing you need to know is that Ford became vice president when Spiro Agnew resigned in October of 1973 because of the 25th Amendment. Now, he resigned because uh, Spiro Agnew had t- – had it, it came out that he had taken bribes. So he resigned as vice president, and then Nixon nominated Gerald Ford. And then once Nixon resigns, then Ford is going to become president. And so that's he's the the only president that has has served as president without actually getting elected as president or vice president. Uh, and that happened in August of 1974. And Ford's presidency didn't get off to a good start because the very first thing he did was give Nixon a full pardon, which many found very controversial. Again, he his idea was okay. We are going. We need to we need to heal now. Um, you know, we can't just. You know, we uh, I, he thought also that it would look very bad for Amer- for America if we had a sitting president that was on trial, um, you know, and, and could be in, in prison in the future. So uh, he was kind of trying to think about that and how that would look to the to the rest of the world. Um, but a lot of people really wanted Nixon to pay. They wanted him to, uh, you know, face his, uh, you know, what, whatever punishment that pe- the, the people were going to think sufficient. So anyway, that's the biggest thing about Ford. Um, again, the. 
the 1976 campaign, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Uh, again, Ford is actually going to narrowly win the Republican nomination over Reagan, who is going to run in uh, in the 1980 election. Uh, there was a D.C. outsider. His name was Jimmy Carter. He won the Democratic nomination in 1976. He was a former Georgia governor, peanut farmer, born again Christian, overall super nice guy, kind of like a man of the people, for lack of a better word. Uh, and he won a narrow victory. Again, this was a kind of a really divisive time uh, in America, uh, and he was he was able to win. So there we go. And this was the, the showing you the, the electoral vote. You see, it was not. Uh, I was pretty close, especially looking at the popular vote. Uh, was only about like a million million seven hundred difference. So that's not too, not not too uh, not too crazy. Also, you see, R Reagan actually got a, a decent amount of votes as well uh, as a third kind of a quote unquote third party. All right, let's get to Jimmy Carter. So he was from 1977 to uh, 1981. Uh, again, so the the thing you need to know is that it, or the, one of the biggest things that he had to deal with was the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Uh, and because of that, the U.S. actually boycotted the 1980 Olympics that were in Moscow. Uh, again, I, there's not I don't, I don't really need you to know a whole lot about the invasion of or the USSR invasion of Afghanistan. Again, they were trying to. Um, I, I, again, it's not it's not even super important, but I think that, again, this is the general like idea was trying to uh, maintain uh, maintain communism around the world. Again, Afghanistan is is a really uh, important oil reserve as well. So there's there a lot of reasons to do so. But again, I, you guys don't need to worry about that. Um, he did actually stop or he started what Jimmy Carter started what was known as the Carter Doctrine, which was to use force to stop Soviet expansion into the Gulf. Uh, specifically, I, I don't know what I'm not. I don't know what the Gulf they're talking about there, but I think that it's like, oh, the Persian Gulf. No, I do know. Look at me go. Um, so again, that was uh, again an attempt to again not. Do, we can't directly go to war again. We we have we had the salt things going on with Nixon, um, and we've kind of eased tensions, but there's still gonna, there's kind of a, a re reigniting of tensions, for lack of a better word. Uh, one the biggest thing. Oops. The biggest thing that Carter did was called the Camp David Accords in 1979. So since World War II, Egypt and Israel had basically been at war with each other for, so that, I mean, that was upwards of like four, 30, 35 years. Uh, and so they, and, and so that was part of the thing is that Israel was, was given to, uh, to Jewish people as, as kind of a safe haven after the Holocaust. And, uh, and so Israel contains, uh, you know, Jerusalem and some of the holiest places in, uh, you know, the three major religions, Christianity, um, Islam, and, and Judaism. And so this was really controversial because uh, essentially it was just a decision by, by a bunch of different countries to carve out parts of, uh, you know, of Palestine and give that area that is really, really, you know, the holiest of holy areas, um, you know, to, to Jewish people. And so uh, this, this was really controversial. And so Egypt, as a, as a predominantly uh, Muslim country, had been basically at war with Israel, um, you know, for that, like the, the, the 30 years or so uh, between that. So uh, anyway, so at, uh, at Camp David, that is like the presidential getaway, Jimmy Carter invited the two, uh, the two leaders of the countries, and they were able to, uh, to establish the Camp David Accords, which was peace uh, between those two countries uh, for the first time in a very long time. Now, the biggest problem that Jimmy Carter faced was the Iranian hostage crisis. Uh, Iran rebels, basically what you need to know, this was actually, I think, done in the, I feel like this was the movie Argo with Ben Affleck, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, so what you need to understand is that I, the I, Iranian rebels overthrew their leader, who was named the Shah. It was not me. Um, and they, during that rebellion, they seized the American embassy, which was on November 4th, 1979. And the rebels held 53 Americans hostage for 444 days. Uh, this is really crazy too, just because uh, Iran was not a super powerful country. Um, but these rebels were, I mean, they had, they had given, gotten these hostages and they were trying to, you know, prove a point, show, you know, trying to get new leadership into, um, you know, into, uh, into their country. And this, they basically like held, there was like nothing that, that Carter could do. He was trying to negotiate, um, and it was, it just never, never got anywhere. And there was Walter Cronkite, who was one of the, um, he's probably one of the most famous journalists, uh, or TV, TV news reporters that had, has ever lived. Uh, he started counting the days. 
uh, because the, like they people kind of thought it was going to be over soon that oh we'll negotiate with these rebels and then it'll be over and it just never did ne- it never ended I mean it obviously did end it but it took over a year and uh, they're actually they were released on uh, on uh, January twentieth, nineteen eighty one, which is the day that Ronald Reagan took office. So that's actually kind of controversial. Um, that makes you kind of think that uh, they they didn't want. Uh, Jimmy Carter to be to be able to get credit for doing that, um, and and maybe even R- Reagan might have played a role in in determining kind of when that was when when those hostages were were going to be released. Again, that's just speculative. We don't really n- know uh, necessarily. But anyway, that's that was the biggest thing. Again, just really a, a small group of rebels that are going to hold Americans hostage for a really long time, uh, and Jimmy Carter could do nothing about it. And this was par- probably part of, part of the reason why he wasn't able to win re-election. Uh, the last thing here is the energy crisis. Uh, so again, OPEC raised their prices again, causing another uh, surge in, in gas prices. Again, no shortages necessarily this time, but again, that is going to really affect the, the economy because people aren't going to be able to get, uh, you know, the, like they're not going to be able to have as much money to spend on, on consumer items and things like that. So Carter during this time, and this is actually really, really relevant is he creates the Department of Energy to try to lessen our dependency on foreign oil and so the the department of energy essentially like manages the energy policy for for america and they do that by you know trying to uh well i mean especially nowadays too like there's there may they might even be like sponsoring research into uh, into more hybrid cars into uh electric vehicles and things like that that are going to allow us to not be so dependent on foreign oil because we, we do have our own oil reserves um but it's not necessarily as much as we need being you know a, a fairly large country um, the other thing that happened uh, during, uh, and it was April 1979, was called a Three Mile Island, Three Mile Island accident. There's a nuclear explosion at the Three Mile Island uh, nuclear power plant. And it, again, nuclear energy is usually considered pretty safe. Um, however, Three Mile Island, uh, they had not updated a lot of their facilities in, in a long time. And, uh, this, and, and so the, anyway, so there was a, a meltdown at the, at the facility. And it basically, like, it kind of showed America that, uh, that nuclear energy wasn't necessarily a safe alternative. Again, it, it kind of depends on how you look at it just with, um, y- you know, more, more, we've had, we have had major meltdowns and, but if it's done properly, like if people are going to, you know, make sure that they are maintaining their, um, you know, their facilities, there shouldn't be any issues. Um, but again, that it did, now there was a, again, a huge kind of backlash against the, the use of nuclear technology, um, be, just because it is, it is dangerous, but you just have to make sure that you are, uh, you know, doing, doing your job appropriately, I guess. What a, what a thought. Uh, and this is Three Mile Island. Sorry about that. Okay, we made it. That's done. Guys, I appreciate you. I'll see you in the next one for the 1980s.